right? Or wait a few seconds. Good evening and welcome to the Michigan Communities Conquering COVID Town Hall. My name is Susan Wolford and I'm a general pediatrician at the Child Health Evaluation and Research Center at the University of Michigan. And I'm blessed to be part of the SEAL project under the leadership of Dr. Erica Marsh and Dr. Barbara Israel. And we're fortunate enough to have both of them with us here at the moment. And um, we'll ask Dr. Marsh to bring us a couple of words. Thank you so much for moderating tonight, Dr. Wolford. Um, I just on behalf of Mishar, uh, um, as well as um, the Michigan SEAL team and the Office of Community Services for Michigan Medicine, we want to welcome everybody, our esteemed panelists and special guests tonight, um, our fabulous um, translator, uh, who you will hear about in a second. Um, uh, and most of all, you are audience members who are taking time out of your evenings to, to come together with us and learn more about COVID, particularly in the context of the younger members of our community and learn how we can conquer COVID together. So with that, I will hand it back over to the very capable hands of Dr. Wolfert, who we're excited to have moderate tonight and um, say how uh, very much we're looking forward to um, this, this panel um, with our special guest and Dr. Wolfert, thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Marsh. Thank you so much, Dr. Isabel, both of you for joining us. And thank you to our panel for being here today. I'd like to take a moment now to introduce them. Uh, we have two students. Susan, with before us, we start, we need Angelica to welcome everyone to the for Spanish speakers so she can switch to interpretation. Pause sure, really quick. We can, we can pause right now and we'll let Angelica do that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Trisha. Now I'll go ahead and I'll direct my words to um, our Spanish speakers. Muy buenas tardes a todos. Uh, bienvenidos por a otra presentación de comunidades de Michigan conquistando el COVID. Como la doctora Wolfer lo acaba de mencionar, me llamo Angélica Snyder. Mi función será la de interpretar todos los comentarios. Si prefiere escuchar la presentación en español, únicamente necesitará escoger la opción Spanish, que es en español, es en, en inglés, que aparecerá en forma de globo terráqueo en la barra de navegación que estará en la parte de abajo de su ventana de Zoom. Bienvenidos. Thank you. Thank you so much. And so we'll introduce our students. Um, we have Kayla Shannon, who is a community organizer for the Greater Flint area and a sophomore at Spelman College. We have Mabuba Sumia, who is a freelance writer in Detroit, a Forbes under 30 mentee, and an entering freshman at Harvard. We also are fortunate to have today two service providers, Mr. Lex Savala, the Director of Development Operations at the D Detroit Hispanic Development Corporation, along with Dr. Patricia Wells, who is the Medical Director of the Corner Health Center in Ypsilanti, Michigan, and our resident COVID expert, Dr. Sandra Sinti. Dr. Sinti is a professor of internal medicine and infectious diseases and a coach. Thank you so much for being here for all of these sessions. And um, I will introduce, although you've already heard from her uh, interpreter for today, Angelica Snyder, who will provide Spanish translation. So welcome to all the panelists and to all of you who have taken the time to be with us this evening. During our session, we'll attempt to answer the questions that we've received so far from the community and those that may come in through the question and answer um, option in the webinar. If we don't have a chance to get to your questions today, don't worry, we will save them and we will answer them in our next session. The importance of the battle of the, or the importance of the youth in our battle against COVID is highlighted by the emphasis that we've seen by many, including the White House and our president in their efforts to reach out to youths. We've seen him incorporate people like Olivia 
Rodrigo into his uh, White House press conferences. And um, we've seen experts like Dr. Fauci showing up on TikTok in order to reach out to young people. So we too realize the important role that youth play. And so without further ado, I'd like to give time for each of our panelists to take two or three minutes for opening comments about their personal thoughts on what they are hearing from young people about COVID-19 or their personal experience. Maybe um, let's start out with our youth because it's all about youth this evening. Um, and maybe Mabuba, would you go first? Yeah, absolutely. Well, thank you so much for the welcome. Glad to be here. Um, I mean, I definitely want to start off by mentioning the effects of COVID um, because it was devastating for a lot of us. And, you know, that effect really exhilarated a lot of inequalities that um, the existing inequalities in American life, whether we're talking about inequalities in education for youth or inequality, racial inequalities, because the disease itself didn't really um, discriminate, but then people did. And you know, I am a student, more specifically a low-income student. So for me, like going to school, like actually attending physical school was really important for me. And it was like a safe space for me. But then obviously like last year when everything was closed down, I really had to stay home. And it just, you know, the reality of home just for people like me just felt so hostile. I know like my brother was also um, in college and then he just chose to live on campus because it was just um, a survival mechanism for me. And then it was just like a whole escape from the reality of home because obviously like at home when you are, um, there are just like a lot of distractions around you and he just really needed to concentrate on his education and um, you know, and his school year strong. But then for me, that was a dissimilar case because I was still in high school and I had to stay at home. Um, and then at first, I really thought that virtual learning would be, um, you know, would be convenient, but then that just quickly changed as the situation got even worse. And um, I mean, definitely there's another thing that I really wanna point out is the fact that that's like really close to home. Um, I mean, both of my parents, they um, did go to work, even though everything shut down. And then because they had to go to work, that was like our only way to survive. And then that was like our main source of the income. Bring COVID with them. And then while I'm still at home, because most of the time, um, my school year was remote. And they, I mean, obviously they took a lot of precautions, but then they were still concerned because obviously like I was a junior and then going to my senior year and then after college, it's like, I'll be moving out of state. And then there are just a lot of concerns that um, they were um, worried about. And it was really devastating because um, I was concerned about my health and then um, everybody around me, but when actually now, now when we have the COVID vaccine, it just feels, we all got vaccinated and it just feels so relieving. And we're just really optimistic about the future because um, this vaccine just really came in a form that's really gonna help us you know, endure this severe alienations that I'm sure a lot of us can relate. Wow, thank you so much for sharing. There's so many concerns during this time. So um, maybe Kayla, can you? And I wanna once again say thank you so much for the invitation. Um, it's an honor to be in this space, an honor and a privilege to exist in this space with you all. And thank you for prioritizing youth voice during this time. So I would say that I've heard a lot of different perspectives of, from youth about the vaccine. I've heard some youth who like me graduated in the midst of the pandemic, which was a very difficult experience, having sort of this transition from being a senior, but not experiencing closure, transitioning into college and not also really experiencing sort of the rites of passage that we normally would. So I've heard a lot of people specifically in my class who are just ready for it to be over. 
um, ready to finally experience college, ready to sort of get some semblance of the normal that we once had and had wished for and spent much of our lives up until this point hoping for. Um, so I've heard a, a lot of those youth just hoping that the vaccine will be an opportunity for us to get back to normal. I have also heard other young people who are, you know, very tentative about it because they don't necessarily understand what the vaccine does, what's in the vaccine, who the vaccine was tested on, what the purpose of vaccines are, um, especially because up until this point, for much of us, that decision of whether or not to be vaccinated has been made by our parents. So taking this transition in the middle of a pandemic and now deciding if you want to take a vaccine that has a lot more weight um, to it is just sort of, you know, a tricky thing to navigate. Um, and then I've just heard people who frankly don't want it because the government said so. And there's this lack of trust of authority, but there's also a lack of trust of an, in government. Um, and there's also, especially for people of color, um, a, a distrust in medicine um, and just medical providers because of historic, because of history, because of um, just the disproportionate impacts of vaccines and of other health struggles in general. So um, I, I would say that I've heard a lot of different um, reactions to COVID and to the vaccine in general, especially because I work as an intern for the Flint Public Health Youth Academy. So that has put me face to face with a lot of young people to hear their concerns. So definitely um, a diverse, uh, I would say I've heard a diverse reaction or response to COVID and the vaccine. Thank you so much. And thank you for raising those concerns that so many people have been mentioning and so many young people have been mentioning. And so I'm gonna to go to Dr. Cinti next and ask if in your response, Dr. Cinti, can you reply to some of those concerns, like how, how it was created and any dangers it has for people? Because um, I'm hoping that lots of young people will look at this because we have young people on it. And so maybe they can get some answers right off the bat about any of those sorts of concerns that they may have about absolutely. Um, the vaccine. Yeah, yeah absolutely. I, and that's what I'm here for, to answer questions. And there are a lot of questions. And um, I say that as I come to these uh, forum and to this forum and to listen to people ask questions that I learn more than I do in most of the settings where I'm with my colleagues because of the questions that are being asked. Um, I, I, I do wanna say those are great questions that are being asked about the vaccines. We know now that these vaccines are very safe. And it, when you think about the hundreds of millions of people that have gotten almost each one of the vaccines that we're giving in this country, they are extremely safe. And we're, we keep finding that they are. I'm happy to answer specific questions about the vaccines, but I would, I've gotten my, my boys who are older, they're in their 20s, but I, I pushed them to get it as soon as they could. And I would push uh, young, younger folks to get it too. Uh, they're safe and they're good. Uh, one of the questions that I often get uh, from younger people is where do I find the right sources of information? And that's a very difficult thing. You guys are much better at we are uh, than adults in many situations at finding information. Um, it can be difficult. Uh, I tell, I tell uh, young people, any, anything that has uh, Fauci on it, you listen to. Uh, and then the CDC is a great resource, the WHO. Um, it can be difficult sometimes to sift through all the information that's out there, even yeah, and it's, even for us in the medical fields. Because I know there are some specific questions, but I do want to reassure people that these vaccines are safe and they work and they work against the variants too. So um, we should be promoting them uh, to, and we should be having kids get them too. Uh, younger kids under the age of 12 Hopefully by the end of August, the FDA will meet and there'll be more information and, and they'll push the back to. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you for that. And so we'll move to our service providers. Um, maybe we'll start with Lex. What have you been hearing and what are some concerns uh, that you're hearing from youth around the COVID vaccine? 
or and COVID in general, not just the vaccine, but COVID in general. So um, for my community, um, <clears throat> excuse me, my community is mainly uh, a community of uh, made up of different immigrants from different Latin American countries or uh, Arabic countries. Um, so there is a huge information gap that's happening and um, the disparities that are happening in uh, communities of color are even more enhanced because a lot of our, our residents are undocumented and didn't qualify for unemployment, didn't qualify for stimulus or uh, the, the child tax credit. Uh, so there, there's a lot of people who slipped through the cracks, a lot of young people who didn't receive those extra helps, especially when you have parents who you know, might be struggling in the, the language that they might speak, then trying to switch to virtual and they have that, that technology gap plus the language barrier and trying to teach their kids from home while dealing with lack of resources was a huge, huge challenge for us um, to be able to meet our, our community's needs. Um, and then a lot of young people, you know, going to school, maybe the one place that they eat, um, it, it might be the one place where they're safe um, because of uh, domestic violence, substance abuse in the home. So we have a lot of rise in domestic violence. We have a lot of rise in substance abuse, um, suicides, uh, suicidal uh, young people um, who were literally stuck at home um, with no outlet, no resources, no nobody to reach out to. So um, that was a huge thing for us, for our kids that attend our youth programs to make sure we're doing um, wellness health checks and things like that and making sure that they have some type of outlet, some place to be able to voice their opinion, let out uh, the, those pent up aggressions um, to be able to, uh, you know, heal from this trauma that they've experienced through this. Um, a lot of the focus was on adults. A lot of focus was on different things. I feel like the youth kind of got left behind through the, this pandemic in a lot of ways. And um, there, there's so many disparities in our community. And then being from an immigrant community, it's worse. So then the information on how safe COVID uh, vaccines are, you know, a lot of misinformation gets circulated a lot faster when you're in this little bubble. Uh, so really being able to break through that bubble and get the right information to the people, especially when the kids a lot of times are the interpreters for the parents. So how do we get the kids educated so that way the parents are educated and are getting the right facts. Um, so that way their their entire families are safe it has been a huge lift for us. Oh, thank you so much. That misinformation has has been the, uh, the source of so many challenges with this pandemic. Um, and I can see how that would be uh, multiplied when there's a language barrier, as, as you've mentioned. So going to Dr. Wells, um, what have you been hearing in, um, in your context at the Corner Center? Even my technical issues will allow the translator to catch up anyway. Um, I think that for the most part, one of the biggest things we've noticed is that although the pandemic definitely created challenges and hardships, um, just like Mabuba was saying that it more magnified disparities that were already in existence, right? So we really saw those uh, disparities in in healthcare, in education, in uh, transportation, in access to food. All of these issues were really magnified through the pandemic and largely ignored by um, the people who are in power to make change. So like Kayla said, each one of those steps as those disparities got wider and were ignored, I think that increased the mistrust in the community, uh, the medical community and the government at large, right? Um, so. In, in PEDS and in adolescent care, definitely we've seen a huge increase in mental health crises, um, in 
people seeking care for ADHD, thinking that they have ADHD when, you know, we all had focusing problems online and through the pandemic, right? But that need to label ourselves and try to get help. So seeking care for ADHD. Interestingly, we also saw a huge uh, amount of weight change. So at one point we saw a lot of people gaining weight. On the converse, there's been kind of an explosion of eating disorders as well. And I think a lot of um, a lot of the changes that we've seen in attitudes and concerns were magnified also by people being in their little echo chambers. We don't have access to all the different opinions and ideas and thoughts that we would normally have. We're really looking at people are really watching social media, right? And so um, those voices that maybe are not the best at teaching us to critically think through information have really taken over in a lot of ways, right? Because they're much more attractive and much louder. And so I think that's another way we failed our kids is really reaching in reaching out to them. I mean, in general, in society, not necessarily anybody on this panel, obviously. Um, I think for education, one of our biggest challenges has been uh, parents, you know, parents and households. So this, this disparity in, increased as well. So Families who um, were well resourced were able to get to form pods and get tutors and get private schools, while families that were perhaps less resourced maybe have five kids in one room trying with siblings crawling all over them while they're trying to attend a class, right? And so um, this has been a huge issue with kids and um, kids at home with either whether it's abusers or um, a chaotic environment or in a, a home with substance use. Um, so we've seen people locked in with people they maybe didn't need to be locked in with. And on the converse, there are definitely people, interestingly, who we saw did better. So people who had pre-existing social anxieties or were bullied in school or who had behavioral issues in school, so were constantly getting reprimanded some of them really did much better at home um, without the sleep challenges and trying to and missing school because they couldn't get on the bus. So being able to log in. So there were, were those people who had pre-existing issues that actually may have done a little bit better during the pandemic. And then of course, there were all the people who um, really struggled with not only from a parenting standpoint, you know, they've got to do their work, like Mabu was saying, you know, parents have to go, still have to go to work. So uh, the teachers are online with their students, but they can't do the discipline or making sure that the kids are. Uh, it's not something we've ever done before, right? Um, stop me when you need to. Um, but we've definitely seen a lot of kids with more depression, self-doubt. We've seen an increase in pregnancy and in sexually transmitted infections because, you know, what else is there to do when you're locked in during a pandemic? Um, and a lot of the clinics were really focused, a lot of clinics being closed, you know, corner state open throughout, but a lot of clinics throughout the country have had to close or uh, reduce services. So people couldn't get their regular routine checks and care and contraception, um, reproductive planning that they may have earlier. So I think, you know, a lot of those issues will really um, uh, meet out over, we'll see a lot of those issues come out more over the next year as we see the effects as people kind of emerge. I will say that as people have emerged in Michigan over the last several weeks, we have been seeing a lift in mood. Um, so where we were getting a, a lot more calls about mental health crises on a daily basis, um, those are starting to lift as people get out and, and are able to see people and get away from their computers and screens and, and maybe unstable situations. Um, you know, the mental health waiting lists for counseling in our area, it, you're really lucky if your mental, your behavioral health therapy waiting list is under four months here. Um, and I think that statewide, sometimes it's, you know, 12 months long at this point. Wow. Thank you so much. It really highlights, I mean, often people say, oh, we are in that we're all interconnected but the pandemic definitely impacts people differently, right? Very much and so. a lot of it related to resources. So thank you so much for that. As I mentioned, we have a number of questions that have been submitted and uh, we have some here, I think for Dr. Senti. 
So um, one of these, I think you got at a little bit earlier, but I'll um, read the question here. It said, when would you expect approval for the vaccine for kids under 12? And I think we have some information on that. In regard to returning to school and the use of masks, distancing, tech, um, et cetera, what do you recommend for best practices? Um, yeah. And, yeah. I'm sorry, Dr. Wolford. I think no, no, I that was it. I was going to say double. I put two in, two together, but yes, the, yeah. those are the two questions. So the, the hope with the, the hope is that when the FDA meets at the end of February, that there'll be more data and more, um, more about kids that are under the age of 12. I think right now, a, a below two years old, we're, we're, we're going to continue to not vaccinate those kids, but two to, two to 12, I think, is where we're looking. Um, we'll see. I, I, I don't know for sure, but that's, that's one time. I know the FDA is meeting around that time. When are they meeting? When do you uh, say they're the meeting? End, they're probably going to meet at the end of August, so it's still a little bit away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, another, uh, so the, the, the issue of the masks is an interesting one. What the CDC says right now, and this is Dr. Fauci, he's supportive of this too, is people who are fully vaccinated, fully vaccinated, meaning you've gotten, and fully vaccinated means in this country, two vaccines with Pfizer or one or two vaccines with Moderna or one vaccine with Johnson & Johnson. So that's fully vaccinated. And then you have to be two weeks after your second dose of Pfizer or Moderna and two weeks from your first from your dose of Johnson and Johnson. Those kids can be in class without masks as long as they can be distanced. And that means three feet away from each other. And one thing to say here is that there's there was a lot made about young people spreading this illness, but it wasn't within schools. There was very the transmission within um, schools. And there was there were people within high school that were spreading this, but they weren't doing it at school. They were spreading it at, at parties and in other uh, uh, settings. So uh, we do know, even at the height, when nobody was vaccinated, that there were some states, some areas that were having in-class, in, in-person school, and there wasn't much transmission in those settings. We do need to push vaccines so people who aren't vaccinated will have to wear masks and that's going to be difficult in the schools how do you how do you know if somebody's been vaccinated or not um, so right now it's going to be all your schools might not follow the cdc recommendations some schools may decide to be much more strict and say everybody wears a mask because we don't know who's vaccinated uh, and we it's hard to figure that out um, other schools may say that You've got to be honest, and we're going to say if you've been vaccinated, you've got to, you can you can not wear a mask. Um, it, some of this will depend on how, watch your community, see how much COVID there is within the community. Right now in Michigan, it's still quite low, but there have been increases. And so when we get above 10, so they do a bunch of testing. And when we get above 10% of all the people who are tested that are positive, that's a little bit higher than we'd like. And so it may be that the state at that point says, do we have to start wearing masks again indoors and in class? So uh, this is in flux. It will change, as you all know, all of you realize things change quickly. Uh, but I, I think uh, right for right now, many schools are going to uh, be wearing masks in, for people who are unvaccinated. And there may be an opportunity to not wear masks if you're fully vaccinated. Now. Right, kids who are in the lower classes who are under 12 years old will all be wearing masks. Thank you so much. Yes, sure. this is going to be um, unfolding over time. So much as so much is with COVID, right? We'll we'll hear more um, over the next few months, hopefully. Well, we have been getting more questions in, um, and there are a lot of questions for our two students, um, and so. I think what we'll do is, so we're going to need to take a break in about a moment or two, minute or two to give our interpreter a, a moment to read the questions and then we'll take the break. So um, we have two questions that came in and they're very similar, um, but I'll read them both. It says, if either of the students were in charge of increasing the number of youths who are vaccinated, 
what would they do to convince individuals to get their shots? So if you could put the world right, how would you do it? Um, and then the other question is um, also to students, what thoughts do you have about engaging youth in vaccine uptake? So we'll let you think about those, uh, your response to that, and we'll take a um, minute of a pause for our interpreter to have a break. It looks like our interpreter was back and we revived in less than a minute. So that's wonderful. Thank you. All right. So which of our students would like to take a first shot at those questions, a first go at those questions? Kayla? Yeah, sure. Um, no pressure, of course. No Just pressure. Like, it's the whole world. <laughs> no. <laughs> Um, so I would say that the biggest thing for me as far as getting youth involved in this conversation in general, but just more largely getting them to feel um, the need and understanding the severity of the situation is just information, right? Like I think we, we underestimate the impact of information that's given in small bite-sized pieces. Um, I think it was Dr. Wells who was talking about the fact that all of us have sort of suffered from like, um, like all of our attention spans have gotten incredibly short. Like at any moment, I, it's just like squirrel and I'm, I'm completely gone. I don't know what you're talking about anymore. I don't know what we were talking about. Um, and so the hard part of giving out information about COVID, about vaccines, about the pandemic in general is just that so much of it are on these long, long websites, right? Where you have to listen to a two hour webinar or you have to read something that's going to take you hours or that's in medical terminology, um, which no one wants to do, let, a, let alone a young person who already is spending time in class having to learn um, or who is in summertime right now and is interested in taking a break from reading long uh, drawn out essays. Um, and so I think the first thing that I would do is just start a campaign that gives out information in bite sized pieces um, that that maybe puts it in a TikTok. I, I love TikTok. Um, or like an Instagram Reels, something that's that's going to be interactive, but that also I don't have to sit and listen to it for anything any more than six to thirty seconds. Like that's as long as you're gonna get. Um, but but I think social media is so important, and we we forget how like we. site or, or check out the CDC site and it's like truly if you go on that site and you see that information like I've gone on that site and looked at that information several times and every time been like do I <laughs> do I want to read this like um so I think just just like I said uh the first thing would just be getting out in information in in smaller packages but then my second thing would just be making it less about the requirement. We get so hung up on this idea of making sure every single person gets it right, which is definitely important. But then the message behind that is you have to get it because I said so, not because this is going to uh, impact us and benefit all of us as a society, as a country, not because it benefits people internationally who don't have the, the privileges or the access that we do. It's all about the restrictions, the requirements, the rules, the laws, like, and, and no, no, really truly no person in general, especially in this individualistic society wants to be told what to do. But I don't know if you've ever tried to sit an 18 year old down when they're just on the brink of freedom and tell them you have to anything. It's like, automatically. <laughs> Absolutely not. Um, so I think that would be my second big thing was just make it, you, you never want to put someone up in a position where they feel like they're losing by
this is a restriction or a requirement and more so about how does this benefit you as a young person for our people trying to get back to college for our people who and let's make it about those things let's make it about all of the things that COVID, that the vaccine will allow us to do rather than the things that the restrictions that are put on people if they don't get it so yeah fabulous i'm so glad this is being recorded because we're going to put all of those things into practice that sounds that's so helpful so insightful and Maguba, anything that you'd like to add yeah for sure i mean i definitely want to echo what kayla just mentioned uh, I mean, social media is definitely the main source where you can target a lot of teenagers or a lot of youth and students. And, you know, when vaccine was available to us, like my age, um, 18, um, it was me and my friends and a couple other group of uh, people, we actually started this rollout where we, um, you know, posted our vaccine card on social media. And then I know social media, Instagram, they have this thing where, everybody started using this one sticker called vaccinated. And if you use that on your story, then you can see other people that use that on their stories and then see like how people are, um, you know, how people are using those stickers. And then there were a lot of times when we got a lot, a lot of different informations from, um, you know, people who are medical experts who know exactly where the stage of vaccines and where we um, are right now and things of like that. And, you know, I definitely admire that because it really, for me personally, I feel like um, things like that, like using certain stickers or using certain hashtags on social media is really important because teenage, all these students are like all into all of that. Um, and then I feel like, um, you know, if it wasn't things like hashtags or stickers or social media, then it would have been much harder to attract um, students like us to get vaccinated. Because when we see like our fellow classmates get vaccinated, for me, it just, you know, motivates me to actually, um, you know, get the vaccines and then be part of the movement where we all want to, um, you know, get vaccinated and be, and then actually experience the normal life that we have been waiting for. Um, and then I would say my second suggestion would be, um, obviously social media, there are pros and cons. And then the cons is that there are a lot of people who use social media to spread misinformation. And, you know, that's a huge problem because the virus is spreading. And then there's another virus, which is the misinformation that we really need to stop because if social media is like the main source for um, student to attract students, then obviously everybody's constantly using it. And who is gonna know what is actually accurate and what's not. And I feel like like celebrities or social media influencers, they, a lot of them, they don't really have the expertise to actually provide medical advice. And I feel like that's when the medical professionals or researchers should step in and actually, um, you know, implement a program where they are um, collectively working with other wide range of um, researchers and professionals and then um, using social media to promote the accurate information it's just so like it just the misinformation doesn't really, um, you know, overlap with the accurate information. I feel like um, that's really going to help us um, get the information that we need just so we can make the best decision for ourselves and then for the people around us. Excellent. Thank you so much. I think I saw, I think I saw um, Dr. Wells on, on mute. Were you going to add to that? Oh, no, I just, uh, these are fascinating points you guys that you're making. I really appreciate it. And I thought it was very interesting, Kayla's point about control, because what do we have during the pandemic, right? A complete loss of control, right? We don't have control. So that's the, that's the one thing we can choose to have control over, then we're going to control, you know, we're going to have that, whether it's the right thing for us or not, just like with eating disorders, you know, it's something you control in your life, so you can control not eating. Um, and so I think that's a fascinating point, and I'm going to really use that. Thank you so much in my, and, and Mabuba too, so many of your points really right, right on target. I really appreciate it.
and I'm seeing it come through in the chat. Everyone is in uh, full agreement with Dr. Wells' comments there that um, those. chat on the question Q&A and it's for Dr. Sinti and it says I have a son who is 15 can the medical professionals share their view on myocarditis risk so that's a particular concern I, I imagine for yes. parents of teenagers in regards to getting the vaccine yeah and yes and the the two vaccines so the two vaccines the mRNA vaccines which are the Pfizer and the Moderna both have had increased risk of myocarditis and pericarditis. And so uh, that has been a little bit concerning, although, and then the risk is really there, but it's, it's a few per million is the risk. And so when the CDC looks at this, they say that the, the risk of death in that age group is still higher than the risk of getting myocarditis. And most of the cases have been very mild in, in uh, kids and they are recovering but it is in younger kids. And so talking to the doctor about that uh, before making that decision, use it, getting the J&J, because now people have the option to get any vaccine they can. Uh, but all of these vaccines have one or two things that are, that are a negative, uh, but overall, those, are, those risks are really, really low. And, and I just wanna echo what Dr. Wells was saying, that these, these two, uh, Mabuba and Kayla, this is great information. Because, you know, doctors talk in 60 minute bites and that is just not, go you're right. I mean, for me to say, go to the CDC and the, the World Health Organization, I realize how uh, difficult that is. And, and you shouldn't, we, we should be figuring out. And, and, I, and I don't know if it's me that should be figuring out, but I'm certainly willing to talk to people who can then put this in words and in places where others can read it, because you're right, we got to get it out in short, brief bursts. Uh, and this information too about pericarditis, myocarditis, I think it raises a lot of concerns. Uh, but really, in the end, these vaccines, you, you're more likely to get myo and pericarditis from getting COVID. Uh, that is well known. And so you need to protect yourself, particularly when there are variants out there uh, that are mo spreading more quickly. Um, so uh, I'll stop there, but thank you very much. Well, as you mentioned the as you mentioned the variants, it gets to another question that's in the chat, which is, why is the vaccine so important to get if you can still get the virus and pass it on? Uh, well, so you're a lot less likely to get the virus and pass it on when you're vaccinated by a lot. So th there's been some talk about, how much have the variants decreased the efficacy of the vaccine? And it's decreased it a little bit in terms of people getting symptoms, but it's still, uh, the, it's still over 90% with the variants in terms of protecting people from being in the hospital and dying. So the vaccine is always the right way to go. Still, the, the chance that if you're vaccinated that you'll get it and spread it to somebody else without any symptoms is very low. Uh, so it, it's not a foregone conclusion that people who are vaccinated will be spreading this. It's very unlikely that they will be spreading this. Absolutely. And it's, I just want to add that it really does protect against death and severe illness. Yeah. So last, looking at the average, I think it was in June, there, was, there, was, there were stats that said that on average, about 342 people were dying a day from COVID in the U.S. And um, like five of those had had a new vaccine. So, yeah. I mean, it's like the vast majority hadn't had the vaccines. If there's one thing you wanna to do to keep yourself out of the hospital or out of, or not dying from, from COVID, the vaccine is, is that, that will protect you. And then of course, as has been said, it is a much, much lower risk of um, transmitting it. So thank you so much for answering that. So I wanna to go to our service providers um, just briefly. You, we, in the beginning, captured a lot about many of the difficulties that were being faced um, by the youth that you see in the communities that you serve. And I wondered, what would you like um, for those policymakers and researchers to know um, that, and hopefully uh, to allow you to be able to address those needs um, most successfully? 
and either uh, Dr. Wells or um, Lex, if you have any thoughts about what, um, what needs are there in uh, the communities that you serve. So I think address and, and, and workplaces as well, the transition back into school and into work. So it is gonna be very difficult for families, I think, to really get back into the routine of waking up in the morning, getting everybody fed, getting everybody out the door, getting onto buses again. There's gonna be a significant amount of anxiety uh, in the home and at school around all of that. So really, I think we've got a collective PTSD right around the, the pandemic anyway. And so getting on those buses, getting into schools, getting up in the morning is gonna be very difficult for everyone. And being in such close contact to other people all of a sudden, um, I think we're really gonna have to take a thoughtful approach to getting back into school and back into in-person workplace. Um, so that's one huge issue. And I think, you know, all I'm, I'm hoping, really hoping that we can really start to use those, our lenses that we um, learned to look through during the pandemic at those disparities to start that, some of that healing. So really, you know, um, you know, we're doing a lot of teaching about bias at Corner, and I'm hoping that uh, other healthcare facilities are doing the same and really examining our own biases and learning uh, um, about our approach and how to address those issues in our communities. Um, and then very real issues, things like transportation, all the other disparities we already talked to, you know, transportation where, you know, people haven't been able to get onto buses. I think there's a, um, uh, a huge call for addressing transportation issues it, throughout the state, um, whether it's public or private. Kids can't get onto Lyfts and Ubers in the way that adults can, even if I wanna send it to a patient. Um, and taking two or three buses somewhere is both not healthy in a pandemic and creates a lot of um, stress and time loss for our patients. So those are two, the, between education and transportation, getting our daycare settled. So I know in, in our Republic schools has elected not to provide uh, before and after care, which is going to be devastating for a lot of working families as they're trying to go back to work and school this fall. Thank you. Lex, would you like to add anything? Well, just to kind of piggyback on what uh, Dr. Wells just said, um, just being able to get those extra resources down to the ground level um, where people can provide those, the transportation um, or access to vaccines or information, um, being able to really um, train up the young people like our two young ladies here to be ambassadors, to, to, to spread information, to be able to teach uh, their peers or their parents um, and really just uh, filling that digital divide as well. Um, there's a lot, so many of our families don't have internet at home uh, so they they weren't able to provide education from home. So now you want to go back to school and we just missed a whole year. So what are you going to do to help uh, get our kids back um, on track when they were already behind in our public school systems as it was? Because uh, especially Detroit public schools, you know, they're they're not as well resourced as other places. So what's that equitable? Uh, service look like for our communities of color when there's all these deep, deep disparities already and the resources that we've gotten through COVID really just hit the tip of the iceberg. You know, there, there's no real deep dive in how do we change our school system? How do we better our transportation systems? Because even for our kids, if we try to catch a bus, most of the times our buses don't show up anyways. So there, there's no way for public transportation uh, for, for it to work with us right now. And then the education and um, language barriers, you know, our, our government isn't given information the way they should to the people um, who have these uh, language barriers. So how are we getting these resources down to the ground level, down to the places like DHCC or other community organizations to really uh, impact the community 
and making sure that you can get a vaccine on any corner. You can you can get our kids to school. There's the extra resources to get our kids back online after school programming, before school programming, food programming, um, those types of things to really uh, get our kids back on track, but not just back on track, but uh, ready there. And now they're worse. And there is no plan for how my kids can catch up his whole, he missed his whole first year of school, you know, because teaching a four-year-old preschool on, on a laptop is not realistic, right? How, how do I teach, you know, row, row, row your boat for five, six hours a day on a laptop? It, it's not realistic, you know? Um, so my son is a whole year behind now and how many kids are like that? And I have resources, right? So for those families who don't have those resources, now our kids are even further behind. So how do we get, our communities to be able to compete with other communities that have those resources and privileges to be able to do these extra things. Wow, there's a lot of work to be done, a lot of work to be done. Thank you so much for that. I'm gonna, um, I think, get to one more question from the, um, from the participants. And this one, again, is to the youth, to our students. Um, the question came in to ask you, how are you going to handle going back to, the, back to college and away from home, I guess, in the middle of the pandemic? How are you going to manage that transition? Okay. There's like okay. funny Zoom, like a uh, double Dutch, like, are you going to go? Are you going to go? <laughs> um, anywho, uh, I would say, so for me, I, as was said, I attend Spelman College uh, in Atlanta, Georgia, and our school has required that everyone who is returning to campus get the vaccine. Um, so although I was going to be vaccinated either way, um, I had to get it. So um, for me, I think my biggest concern is being in Atlanta, coming from Michigan to Atlanta, um, because Georgia has been a lot more lax about COVID in general. Um, I'm grateful to have been in the pandemic in a state with a governor who followed closely the instructions of scientists and doctors and researchers. Um, that same regard wasn't held in the state of Georgia, uh, nor in the city of Atlanta specifically. Um, so it, there is that concern of being surrounded by people who have at least lived under the authority of someone who has less regard for the science of it all. Um, so that has been a concern for me. But um, Quite frankly, my plan is just, I, I'm blessed enough to also be in a single dorm in the fall. So um, my plan is to just sort of stay in the bubble as much as I can. Uh, the bubble of my campus, which is which is a, a bunch of fully vaccinated people, but then also just my bubble of my room um, because I'm, I'm an extrovert, but the pandemic has made me a bit more introverted as I'm sure it has for all of us. Um, so there, there's definitely a, a certain extent of anxiety there um, with making that transition out of state, but also I, I'm just going to frankly continue to trust the science, continue to do the research, and continue to trust God to, to guide and lead beyond that. Amen. What a great approach, <laughs> Mavuva. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, obviously, like for me in the fall, like that's when I'm actually starting college. And then starting college is like a huge transition on top of that. When you have an outbreak going on, it's an, another uh, thing that you have to worry about. And, you know, I, even though I got both of the tools, I still wear my mask because it's just something personal that I am like, um, you know, I got the vaccine, but still just to be uh, in the safe zone, I am going to wear the mask. So like even when I go to the grocery shops, I still wear my mask because um, it's just like something that 
makes me feel comfortable and safe and I just prefer on doing it. Um, and then also in the fall, I'm definitely planning on, um, you know, still wearing the mask, even though um, my school harbored, they said everybody has to get vaccinated or else they can't really come to campus, which is a great thing because now people that weren't really sure whether or not they want to get the vaccines have to get vaccinated because everybody want to interact with their friends and then at least, you know, be part of these social activities. Um, but then they can't do that if they're not vaccinated. Um, so I'm glad that encouraging um, students to get vaccinated. They also have a couple of sites where they're actually offering the vaccine, which is another thing that I'm glad that they're doing because for a lot of students, like they live really far from, um, obviously like everybody's from different states. And then for a lot of them, vaccine isn't really that accessible. So I'm glad that they have that option for students who, you know, didn't really get the vaccine in their home state, but then they can when they move out. Um, but I feel like there are a lot of things that concerns me, even though I am taking every precautions that is out there. Um, and then people around me are also taking precautions. I feel like um, I don't really know exactly if I have this single dorm or I'm gonna be, uh, I'm gonna have a roommate. Um, usually it's like you have to live with a roommate. Single is like very rare. Uh, so I'm likely gonna get a roommate, but then, um, which I am really excited about. But then the thing that concerns me is the fact that I don't really know exactly if, you know, if my roommate actually goes somewhere and then gets COVID or things like that. Like I know there's another variant, the Delta variant, which is out there, who knows. Um, and I'm just concerned because obviously like I'm gonna be living with them. And um, it's like, um, you know, in a one, one single room, you're just rooming with another person and then you don't know exactly where they were or what they're doing, um, which is something that really concerns me, but I am for sure gonna take, um, you know, continue taking all the precautions that I can. And then, um, and then I will try to, you know, actually, um, if I see something is wrong and then I will just talk with my roommate and see like, oh, we should just step in and then, you know, take this precautions because this is for both of us we're living in the same room so yeah definitely things like that but I'm sure as we um, get closer and then uh, more people get vaccinated things will just feel much um, settled in thank you so much that you um, both have shared such important thoughts and in the last few minutes that we have I'm going to ask uh, the remainder of our um, panelists if there is any one thing that you could say to youth, what would it be? What would be the one thing that you would like to say to youth if you could? And anyone can, can jump in on that <laughs> um, as you would like. While you all are thinking, I just want to say really quickly that I'm hoping to see each of our specialists and you, Dr. Sinti, on TikTok sometime soon. I'll be waiting for it. This is like, I'm calling you out. We're going to need your help, Kayla. We're, we're going to have to, we'll have to have you help. Definitely. Us I'm going to need help. I would be happy to do that if you can figure out a way to make me talk less. <laughs> Kayla, my quicker. entire... My entire staff is laughing right now because I've been trying to get them to go do TikToks <laughs> for 15 months. <laughs> so I, this is, I'm so excited right now because I have, I have a reason. Wow. To TikTok. Well, I think, I think Kaylee, you said what you have said it for us. We're all going to try and get our message on TikTok. Yeah. I think the message that I would like to get to youth on TikTok is that it comes from what you said about control. That if you really want to think about it, the virus wants to take control of our body, mm -hmm. right? If we don't do something, it takes over our body, stops our body from doing the things that we want it to do and uses it for its own purposes. So the best way to take control of your body is to make sure that the virus can't get into it. So let's find a way to put that on, on TikTok. <laughs> um, and we have reached at the end of our time together. And I would just want to thank each one of our panelists 
for their time and for their insights. It has been phenomenal. I want to thank Kayla and um, Kayla and Mavuba, and we wish you your best in the st your studies in the year to come. Um, we want to thank our service providers, Lex Kavala and Patricia, Dr. Patricia Wells. Thank you to, and for all you do for your patients and your organizations do for, uh, um, for our state. And to Dr. Sinti, as always, for lending your expertise um, to this town hall meeting. I'd like to thank all of those in the background who make this happen. Patricia Pachowski, Amy um, Rocker, and all of the SEAL teams and Misha. And again, Dr. Erica Marsh and Dr. Israel. Um, who ha are the leaders who make this, who envisioned this, and thank you. Stay Thanks, well. good night, everybody. And thank you, Susan, for uh, an exceptional job as moderator. And thank you again to our outstanding panelists for your expertise and, and wisdom, to Angelica for making this event um, accessible to a broader audience. I am going to sign up for tic tac toe um, uh, and try to make it try to make it work. I, I'm not on Insta Chat yet, but I'm working on that too. Um, but I now I feel at least I have some experts that I can reach out to. So Dr. Cinti and I will 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 be uh, will be reaching out to you for some special one on one two or two two on two tutelage to get us ready for social media. But in all seriousness, thank you, thank you for the wisdom. Thank you for your perspective. Thank you for bringing the voice of so many to, to so many. Um, we need to hear you. We need to listen. We, we have to learn and we have to conquer this virus. And, and in partnership with our community partners, with our um, young people, with our older communities, with, you know, with everybody together, we're gonna, we're, we are gonna do that. But uh, um, this was a really special event, um, and I, you know, Mabuba, Kayla, Lex, Dr. Wells, I want to thank you for being our special guest, Dr. Senti. As always, you are you have been a rock. Have been here every single town hall, and we appreciate that more than you know. Um, Angelica, again, thank you for your expertise, and Susan, thank you for your excellent job as moderating, and thank you for the. Um, for, to the Office of uh, Community Services, to Mishar, and to the SEAL team for making all of this possible. So thanks, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate Thank it. Thank you. Thank Angelica.